Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Community Platform. So today is a very special program and hence the reason we had to change the time slightly. So humble apologies to all those people who may join us at 7 o'clock. We will continue until 7.30, but uh, our sincere apologies. Justice and injustice, haq and batil. We're today going to be talking about someone who has been drowned in working for justice. Mazen Beg is the name. But who is this person? What does he do? What's his personality like? Do you know him? Have you worked with him? What football team did he support? What's his favorite food? We want to get to know the man and the work, the humanitarian work that Muazzam has done over the years. So if you know of him, you know him, call me. But today I'm delighted to have someone in the studios who really knows Muazzam, worked with him, continues to work with him. We welcome Kerry Kaleem Bolivant. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So grateful to have you here. Thank you very much for having me on. No, it's, you've taken such a long journey to be with us, but, but then again, we're not talking about just any person, are we? No. We when, it, when, it, when it comes to Mazen, um, any distance travel wouldn't be far enough. Um, to Mazen's character was of such a light that it's essential that people um, get to know him and get to know what sort of person he was because it's through that that we, we can inshallah realize the, the necessity of uh, calling for his release and, and realizing what, what an inspiration he was. Well, uh, j just before we begin, uh, Kalima, I just want to read something out. Uh, today I've received a message from his wife and I just want to read something out about, about Muslim. If I can just read a couple of lines to you and Kalima, I'm going to come back. I just mm -hmm. want to start with this. <coughs> she says that Muslim change has changed my life in a way that I'd never imagined that he would. He taught me about matters of deen, of struggle and patience. He would teach me intricate details of the world and his affairs narrate to me stories of the past, confide me in me his experiences both terrifying and good. Through him I experienced different places in the world and met some of the most amazing people. And then she talks about a quality, this is what we're look, looking for, what sort of qualities does this man have? And she said that one of the qualities that she found most profound in him was his sincere love for each brother and sister of his ummah. And this keeps coming back. It's not just from his, uh, his wife, but from his friends. Do you mm. relate to that? I remember we were coming back, my wife and I, from, from a holiday in Amsterdam. Now, bearing in mind, Muslim is a very well-known person, a very well-known character, and uh, I needed a lift. And I, I got in touch with Muslim. I was like, do you know anyone in Birmingham who, who can come and pick us up from the airport? And lo and behold, when we arrived, Muslim was sitting there. Himself? Him, himself. Because this is the sort of person he was. Even for... For anybody, he would put himself out mm. for them. And if you look time and again, this is what he did. For Sister Afia Siddiqui, for so many cases, for Shah Amir, mm. where he took time away from his family, where he took time away from the, the, the places that, that he might have wanted to be himself, to, to work for other people. It's why it becomes an obligation on me to come here for you. No, no, but it, it just, I mean, I remember when I first met him, uh, and I was expecting this bulky six feet tall person. Because mm. after, the, yeah. and as soon as I walked in, I saw this young man, who, you know, I'm not much taller than I was. <laughs> and I said, you're Muslim then? And he said, yes. Yeah. But, uh, but an absolutely amazing character. But it was, what I found, it was how calm he is. Yeah. How, and I said, I had to ask him, what makes you so calm? Yeah. The thing, is, the thing with Muazzam is that he was maybe small in stature, mm. but colossal in character. Absolutely. And, and that came across every time pe people spoke to him. Mm. His um, generosity of kindness and, 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 and softness of spirit mm. was instantly an, an, an attracting quality. Mm. And subhanAllah, Everybody that, you, that knows him and that spoke to him has nothing but good words for him. In fact, his only detractors are the people that haven't met him. 
Yeah, and it's very gentle. I found him very softly spoken. Yeah. Very, very softly spoken. In fact, I remember he said to me, he said, you do get angry very quickly, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, it's a quality that I have. <laughs> but very gentle, yeah. very peaceful. The, the, this is why when you hear the accusations against Moaz and, mm. and, and the, the situation that he, he's gone through, it, it becomes even more painful because you know that, that he's one of life's gentle souls. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I remember hearing his daughter speak very eloquently and very yes, movingly, I did. Um, and she she said that um, I would have thought Guantanamo was enough of a test for anyone in one lifetime, um, but yet he's taken again and, and, and he's in this uh, going through another test, and it's true that Allah tests the one He loves, and it, the 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 quality of patience in Muazzam is one that has been tested and tested. And uh, Alhamdulillah, he has always been there when his Ummah needs him. T tell me something about him. I mean, you know, we know he's gentle, we know he's mm. honest, we, his integrity. I mean, it's not, it's not just you and I discussing. There are yeah. people who have said to me, you know, they believe in his integrity. Um, what's he like as, uh, as a human being? Did he enjoy football? Did he enjoy cricket? D did he enjoy curries or didn't he <laughs> not eat curries? What was he like? He's an incredibly funny gentleman. Really? Um, he, he's, he's got a, a, a wit that's razor sharp. Um, and he, he, he's very, very quick at picking up a, a, on, uh, on any um, uh, contradiction or double stand. Mm -hmm. and, and in a very playful and, and, and light way, just picking it out. Mm -hmm. And very, very funny guy. Um, we, we, Asim would say that whenever Moazim came to the office, no one would get work done that day because everybody would be confiding in him their problems, talking to him about their issues. And, and if they weren't doing that, they were laughing and joking with him. It, it's, I often wonder whether it's not what he says, but he, how he says it. Hmm. You know, it's the, one of the things that is often forgotten about Dawah and about how you carry a message of hope is, is that it's not just the words, it's the character that you portray in and of yourself. Um, and I know for myself, coming to Islam, that, that was very important. I saw good mm -hmm. character from the Muslims. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was something that made me think, well, look, there must be something in this, because there are so many of these good people um, that are affected by this. And Muazzam is one of those people. Mm -hmm. he, he exemplifies mm -hmm. the, the, mm -hmm. the Islamic character and the, the, the Islamic mindset mm. of how to be a modern progressive person in, 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 in this day and age, Absolutely. but still hold tight yeah. to the rope of Allah. Karim, I'm sorry I'm cutting you there short. I've got uh, um, uh, Azam Beg, Muslim's brother on the line. Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam alaikum. Salaam alaikum brother. Uh, in fact, we were just talking about uh, Muslim's likes and dislikes and you being his brother could tell us much more. Tell me something about Muslim and what was he like as a brother to you, you know, when you were young? Hmm. As a brother, we're chalk and cheese. We're very different in our characters. Um, some of our principles are the same, but um, Muslim is a lot more reserved and, and thinks a lot more about issues. And um, when we were young, um, we were taught to read the Quran, um, as a lot of young Pakistani boys are, from a Pakistani lady. <coughs> and uh, Muslim had a concern that he was reading something which he did not understand at that age, of course, we were reading it parrot fashion. And uh, he took it on himself to learn Arabic so he could understand the message of the Quran. And I think that was, uh, he did at a very young age, which was uh, very different to a lot of the other boys at that time who would just go through the emotions and learn. So well, what I'm trying to say is that he found his faith in Islam at a very young age and uh, he took it upon himself to carry out his life in a fully Islamic manner. Sure. I, I, I remember uh, saying to him um, uh, when I met him uh, some time back that uh, I, I read his book and I became very angry and very upset. And when he was there speaking, I said, Muslim, help me to understand how you can remain so polite and so uh, calm. And he, he pointed to his heart. He said, if I didn't, I would be going against my faith. And yeah. I found that overwhelming that a man who can spend three years at Guantanamo Bay go through some horrendous situation and yet 
tell me that his faith is dictating his behavior. Yeah, I think Muslim always had a lot of sabr, you know, impatience with things where um, a lot of people, especially in our family, we, we tend to get angry very quickly, but uh, Muslim was different in that way. Um, he had a lot of patience, um, especially when, when we grew up, uh, there was a lot of racism around in the 80s, and um, a lot of people used to react to it, but uh, Muslim always kept self-control in, in these matters, and, uh, and he still does today, he's still very calm and and collected in, in his responses to things. Sure. I know that um, uh, his organizations and you in particular have done some awareness program about the great humanitarian he was, he is, and the work he's done. Can you just highlight at least a couple of w pieces of work that he has done, certainly yeah, from sure. a humanitarian so, perspective? So, so during, during the Bosnian conflict, um, a lot of refugees were coming to Birmingham. Um, these were white Caucasian people, and I think that was his first experience of actually interacting with uh, people who were of, of white, white color, but were Muslims. And uh, when he heard some of the uh, horrific stories coming out of Bosnia in the 90s, I think him, and of course there were lots of other people, um, took it on themselves to collect, collect charity uh, and relief aid and um, go in the convoys to Bosnia into the uh, war zones and start distributing aid especially to villages where a lot of the um, humanitarian organizations like the Red Cross and UNHCR couldn't get to. Uh, more than many colleagues at that time took it upon themselves to get, it, to get into these areas and, and distribute aid to people who really needed it. Um, so, yeah, he, this was one of the, the main pivotal areas in his life where he saw the, uh, the suffering of, of people um, sure. in the conflict. And I think that drove him to to try harder to help these people, especially the Muslims around the world who are suffering in the various wars. Mm -hmm. you, you, ha you have an event that is coming up, is it? Uh, uh, or has that, you've got uh, an event in London or is it Birmingham? I'm not quite cl clear. Uh, I, I, that, was, that was last weekend. So there were mm -hmm. a series of uh, events um, which took place which were based on, on the issues of Palestine and Syria and also sure. highlighting, you know, is it a criminal act to do humanitarian work and so, so these events took place over Reading, Manchester, Birmingham, London. Thank you so much for your time. Our duas are uh, with you and your family, of course. Jazakallah khair, and that was Azam Beg, Muslim brother. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Kaleem, sorry, I, uh, I had to cut you there. I know you were yeah. explaining about his, um, no, that he came and, uh, you know, in his own car to pick up. Yeah. But that is Muslim, isn't it? He'll always put himself yeah. out. And, as Azam made a very powerful and important point there, that um, if you look at the life of Muazzam as a whole, there's one thread that runs continuously through it all, and that's him putting himself out, him putting himself into difficulty to aid and support other people. So whether it was going to Bosnia, um, taking that extra step, going that extra mile, going to Bosnia to deliver aid, whether it was going to Afghanistan at a time when the country was like in ruins after years of war to build girls' schools because girls weren't getting education. Sure. Whether that was his work after Guantanamo Bay when he was putting himself out, taking time away from his family. Remember, he didn't see his son for three years. From, uh, his, son was, his youngest son at that time was born while he was in prison, mm -hmm. and so he didn't see him for three years. But still, he took time out and away from his family that he loved dearly and hadn't seen for so long to go and campaign for people that were still in Guantanamo Bay, mm. to campaign for people that were still affected by, by these measures. Mm. This was his character again and again and again. It's this same thread that mm. just runs from a very, very young age where, um, as he says in his book and as Azam was saying, he was affected by the racism in, in, in the area and he wanted to do something f to help people. And that, that, that thread runs through. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's all a form of sadhaka, whether it's literal sadhaka in Bosnia or the sadhaka of um, giving his time to support and help his brothers in, in prison. Such a heightened sense of justice, isn't it? And the, this, yeah. these two words, justice and justice, haq and batil, S such an intense, heightened sense of justice that anything else 
Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm going to take this call because it's all the way from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum Saad bhai. All the way from Pakistan. Jazakallah khair. Aapne humko apna time diya. You are, is waqt aap live hai on Umma TV channel, on community platform. Aaj ka jo mawzu hai, hum baat kar rahe hai ke the character and of course the work of Mawazim Beg. You, آپ نے خود کچھ وقت گزارا ہے معظم کے ساتھ ان بے گرام اور وہ کافی سخت وقت تھا تو کیا آپ مجھے کچھ بتا سکتے ہیں جب اس کے دوران بھی معظم کا کیریکٹر ہمیشہ ایسا تھا کہ وہ دوسروں کی مدد کرنا چاہتے ہیں تو آپ کوئی ایسے اتفاق ہوا کوئی ایسی باتیں ہوئیں جو آپ کو یاد ہیں جی میں جب مجھے ایجپٹ سے بگرام لائے گیا تھا تو سب سے پہلے جس شخصیت کے ساتھ میری ملاقات ہوئی تھی وہ معظم بیگ ہی تھے اور اس وقت چونکہ ٹورچر کے بعد بگرام میں پہنچا تھا اور وہاں پر کافی جیسے آپ نے کہا کہ کافی سخت حالات تھے اور ان حالات میں اگر ہمیں مجھے نہیں بلکہ میرے جتنے بھی وہاں پر قیدی تھے اگر کسی نے سہارہ دیا تھا تو وہ معظم بیگ تھے اس سہارے سے مراد یہ ہے کہ ان کی بہت زیادہ ماشاءاللہ ملنسار طبیعت تھی اور بہت رحم دل تھے اور ساتھ ان کی کوشش ہوتی تھی کہ اپنے ساتھ جو رہنے والے ہوں جن کے ساتھ ان کا ڈیریکٹلی یا ان ڈیریکٹلی تعلق ہو وہ ان کے ساتھ محبت سے پیش آئیں اور ان کے ساتھ ان کو دراسہ دیں یہاں تک کہ بلکہ ساتھی اتنے پریشان تھے تو معظم بیگ نے ہمارے لیے وردش کی کلاسز شروع کر دی تھی کہ آئیں میں آپ کو وردش سکھاتا ہوں اور اس طرح ہمارا ان کے ساتھ ٹائم جو ہے وہ ایک استاد اور شاگرد اور کلاسز سے کے ساتھ بھی ہمارا بہت اچھا ٹائم گزرا ہے سبحان اللہ ہر تکلیف میں جب ہمیں عذیت ملتی تھی یا ہمیں تورچر کیا جاتا تھا تو معظم بیگ ہی تھے جو ہمیں دراسہ دیتے تھے بلکہ ہمیں کسی بھی قسم کی نیگیٹیف ریاکشن سے روکنے والے بھی معظم بیگ ہی تھے کہ آپ نے صبر کرنا ہے آپ نے کوئی اوور ایکٹنگ نہیں کرنی یا آپ نے نیگیٹیف جو ہے نا ان کے ساتھ برتاؤ نہیں کرنا بہرحال ہم مسلمان ہیں اور ہمارا دین ہمیں یہ سکھاتا ہے کہ ہم انسانیت پرست ہیں ہم محبت کو پھرانے والے ہیں اور چاہے ہمارے ساتھ یہ جیسا بھی برتاؤ کر لیں لیکن ہمیں اپنی اسلام کے پہلے ہم اسلام کے سفیر ہیں ہم بحثیت مسلمان ہمارا اخلاق وہ ہونا چاہیے جو رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم اور قرآن کریم کا تھا باتیں تو آپ کی بہت دیر تک سن سکتے ہیں مگر مجھے اندازہ ہے کہ بہت دور سے اور of course there's a time difference سعید بھائی آپ کا بہت بہت شکریہ دعا میں یاد رکھئے گا انشاءاللہ جزاک اللہ خیر السلام علیکم I'm sorry I don't think you would have understood some of because he was speaking in Urdu but he was describing exactly what you had been saying that even when this gentleman who was in Begram with him that he was even after there were tortures and everything Muslim would say we have to live the high standards it doesn't matter what other people do It's what we do that matters. Yeah. And, you know, we have to live the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you're absolutely right. That constant thread mm -hmm. that uh, runs the heightened justice. Muslim, he, if he saw injustice anywhere, and I, I do mean anywhere in terms of to Muslims or to non-Muslims, he felt a personal responsibility to, to work and to, to try and aid those people, to try and ease their suffering. And you, you mentioned before his n integrity. Honestly, the, the amount of things and the amount of uh, attacks and, and the amount of um, uh, things that he suffered because of that integrity, because he refused to remain silent and, and just let it pass. Just, mm -hmm. look, today it's not my problem. No, it was always his problem. And he always spoke out, regardless of the cost to himself. And that's why... It, he, he is where he is. But you see, I often wonder that if you believe that, you know, God loves those who fight mm. for justice, yeah. and if you feel that, you know, sometimes you make mistakes, that you are 
doing the right thing, then surely your faith does carry you through, doesn't it? Yeah. Th this is the thing. And Moazem uh, has said in his book, and he said to me on many occasions, that he would never have got through uh, Guantanamo or Bagram if it wasn't for his faith. Because he knew that he went to, to Afghanistan to build those girls' schools, to do good work, and to, and to uh, try and help these people who, who, needed, who needed help. And it was that good intention, that good action, that led him to, to, to uh, end up in those places. And people should remember that, as, a, the, as a, your, your guest was there with him in Bagram, that Bagram was worse than Guantanamo. Yes. And that he says that when he, when he was in Guantanamo, it was um, less arduous and, and less harsh than, than in Bagram. Mm. So let's not forget our brothers uh, that, are, that are still there. But this is the issue. Muazzam was always someone who, even through those hard times, he didn't let that stop him from doing good deeds when he came out. When he came out of Guantanamo, he could have said, look, I've done my bit now. I, I, I went there, I, I did a good deed, and, and I ended up spending three years of my life in one of the worst prisons in the world because of it. Mm. He could have said that, he didn't. Mm. So what did he do? He came back and he carried on doing good deeds. Mm. And, and his reward for that will inshallah be in the akhirah, mm. but in the dunya he, he's tested more again. Mm. And subhanAllah, this is a, a, a very profound sign that even when these things happen, Muazzam keeps on, on that thread. It's quite an honor, actually, because you know him much more than uh, uh, most of us. But you've worked with him, you've, you know, you've sat with him, you've joked with him. You know, mm. Alhamdulillah, it's a blessing. It's it a must be, blessing. you know, to know. I mean, yeah. it, 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 I'm sometimes I'm absolutely lost for words to describe this man who, after he came back from uh, Guantanamo Bay, he could have easily said, you know what? I'm going to spend my night time with my family, yeah. right? I don't want to get involved in all this. I've done my bit. Yeah. But he did the opposite. Yeah. He, he threw himself even more into it. And Alhamdulillah, I, th I really feel blessed that I've had the opportunity to, to um, spend time with Moazim and, and get to know him in, in detail. Moazim introduced me to my wife. Um, and and uh, arranged our marriage, and so I wouldn't have my daughter if it wasn't for. Are you telling him. me that you accepted an arranged marriage? <laughs> well, when, when the person doing the arranging is Muazzam, then uh, Alhamdulillah. Can't say no to that. <laughs> you can't say no to that. Of course, we're discussing about the uh, the work of Muazzam Beg, the character, uh, what's he like, um, his likes and dislikes. So, if you know him, the number is on the screen. Please do call us. We did hear from. Azam Beg, his brother, talked to us about it. We talked about, uh, also heard from uh, Brother Saad, who's in, in, uh, in Pakistan, who rang us, actually, uh, to talk to us uh, about the time in Begram. And it keeps coming back that he's very gentle. Mm -hmm. He's gentle, isn't he? I'd say gentle giant, but he's not big enough to be a giant. He's, <laughs> he, he's a very, very soft man. Um, and in his, in his character, in, in the way that um, he, he carries himself, even in the smallest of things, even in the, in, the, in the smallest details, he's always got that softness and gentleness. There's a reason why when he was in Guantanamo and when he was in, in Bagram, that the, he was chosen to be the arbiter in, in disputes, that he would be the go-between between, between the guards and the, and the prisoners. Sure. Because he was a man of, of conscience and fairness, mm. but someone who could um, uh, bring people together rather than drive them apart. He's a um, good arbitrator. He was an always seems to mm. bring it together. We're going to pick up again. We're going to take a short break. Please don't go away. It is an important topic, a topic that we should all be concerned with. Um, it's, it's about a man who stands up for justice, and it's how he stands up that we're interested in. We'll be back in a short while. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Community Platform. Once again, apologies to those who usually join us at 7 o'clock till 8 o'clock. We had to schedule this program a little earlier because of extended time. It was a special program because we're discussing a very special human being. 
His name is Mazen Beg. We discuss, we're looking at about, about his character. Who is this man, you know? Mazen the man. Who does he represent? What does he represent? Um, his humanitarian work. Um, we listened to Azam Beg, his brother who called us. We listened to Brother Saad who called us from Pakistan. About the time that he spent, both of them spent in Begram. At the start of the program, I read you a few lines from an email that I received this afternoon from his wife. And I just want to go back and read you just a couple more lines before we go back to our guest and ask him to t tell us more about Mazam, the character and the good work that he's done. And she talked about the quality that the most profound was his sincere love for his ummah. She says that no matter how busy he, were, he was, no matter how many interviews he did, or how, many, how famous he got, because this, he is very famous, there's no doubt, doubt about it, if any brother or sister contacted him seeking his advice or assistance, he would give it without hesitation. He would make up in the middle of the night and he would sob. This man, who spent three years in Guantanamo Bay, would cry at night. Why would he do that? Because he was frightened that he was not doing enough. Not doing for enough for those people who le he left behind at Guantanamo Bay. Kalim, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. That his wife is saying that he was cry at night because he, was, he didn't feel he had done enough for the brothers he left behind. I think one of the things that you saw in Muazzam was that he carried around the burden of he was the one that survived. He, he was one of those that were lucky enough to be released. But his best friend is still there. And, and, and just tell that's me who that was. that was. Shakir Ahmed. Who was yeah. in? Shakir Ahmed was, is the, the last British resident um, to be held in, in Guantanamo Bay. He's been there for 11 years now. Um, and it's the, the fact that he's been released or, or uh, he's been cleared for release now for, for six years, for six years, um, the American government have said that there is no threat, he's no danger, he committed no crime and he should be released. And yet they still refuse to let him come back to his, his wife and his children here in the UK. Now for Moazem, this was, this was something that he carried with him, knowing that him and his best friend went out to Afghanistan together. They had a, a bookstore in Birmingham together. <laughs> They were captured around the same sort of time, and they were together in Guantanamo. And now he has been given his life back and his freedom back, okay. and his best friend is still there. This hurt him. It, it, it's not possible to be in a situation like that without feeling the, uh, the loss inside of yourself every day. Okay, okay. Um. It's, it's amazing that somebody can be so sensitive, mm. right? So, somebody can be so sensitive and feel so much that he would sob at night. He would sob at night. Um, d d what does that say about that, uh, that kind of a human being who, is, who didn't have to cry, who didn't have to do anything? In fact, when he came back from Guantanamo, he could have said, you know what? Not doing it. Yeah. And many people have said, okay, that, that, that's enough. That, that I can't, I, I, I've done my bit now. I've stepped up to the plate. Now I need to take some time and recover and stay away from the, these situations and give my children their time or give mm -hmm. my wife her mm -hmm. time. Muazzam couldn't do it. It just wasn't in him. He just... He, physically to, to tell him, stay at home and just, just relax. He, he couldn't do it. He would, he would he'd itch to, to, to get out there and, and to try and do some good. He would say that even if you do 1% good, it's 1% better than it was. You know, I was watching his uh, daughter um, mm. give an interview several, a couple of few months ago now, and I was thinking to myself, do they... Are they angry with Muslim? Are they angry because if father's been taken away again? Mm. They need him at home. Everybody needs their father at home. Yeah. You know, you may not be around them all the time, but you know that your father is going to be coming home. He would be there when you graduate. He'd be there when you know 
you go to school your first day, you'd yeah. come back. These are the things that children have missed. Yeah. You know, and that must be very painful. It, it, it's impossible to, to square every circle. And okay. Muazzam's life is a, is a life of sacrifice. Um, it's, a, it's a life where he's time and again mm. given from himself for other people. And I think having spoken with Mariam, his daughter and his son, they're exceptionally proud mm -hmm. of their father and of the man that he is. Mm -hmm. And they're exceptionally proud of the, of the things that he has achieved. But they know that they, there's been a cost to that. Okay, let's just take this call. Salaam alaikum, Brother Azhar from Manchester, I believe. Hello, yes. Salaam alaikum. Um, I'm actually just to understand the uh, after release and his work, humanitarian work in Pakistan. Uh, if Karim happens to know or if you know, uh, what sort of experience he has uh, <coughs> been getting from Pakistan in terms of finding uh, the areas where the justice to the people is not being done and they have been in prisons for years and years without getting anywhere. Is there any light on this issue if possible? Mm. That, 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 you're breaking up, brother. Can you hear me? Sorry, can you, can you hear me now that's, better? That's better, that's better. Sorry, you wanted to ask a question? Yes, I just, I just wanted to know about Muslim big release after releasing and is working in Pakistan, what are his experiences in terms of engaging other people who are in prison there for quite some time and, and for whom there has not been any justice? I'm trying to understand a line in which obviously he has got the experience and he has shown concern about all this, uh, <coughs> these sure, issues sure. relating to the justices. So sure. I'm just trying to understand what has his experiences are there with the to Pakistan. Do you want to take that up at all? You want to talk about uh, Kaleem? You want to respond to that? Yeah. Uh, Muslim was always concerned with the, the situation in Pakistan, partly because it, it, it's where he came from. Mm -hmm. um, and he was one of the very first people to take up the issue of, of, of drones, of the um, people being disappeared from Pakistan, sure, sure. Um, and kidnappings. And he worked tirelessly with, with people from all, all different areas of, of society mm -hmm. to try and uh, con continue, continue that work. D uh, and if I remember correctly, he also highlighted the, uh, the plight of uh, Dr. Afiya Siddiqui. Yes. You know, and he works very closely with Dr. Fazia herself. Yeah. Um, um, Muazzam spoke at many rallies in Pakistan for, for sure. doc Dr. Afiya. Um, and for, for those of your viewers that don't know, that, uh, don't know the case of Dr. Afia, she was kidnapped from the street in Karachi mm -hmm. um, with her children and she disappeared for, for five years and nobody knew where she was, nobody knew where her children were um, and uh, sh it was Muazzam and his investigations with Yvonne Ridley that uncovered that she was the, the person that they had referred to as the Grey Lady of Bagram. Yes. Um, they'd seen this woman in Bagram and nobody knew who she was mm -hmm. um, and in one instance Moazam recounted that he was in, in his cell um, and uh, sorry, he, he was being interrogated and as he was being interrogated um, there was basically uh, uh, cries coming from, a, from a, the next yes. room of a woman mm -hmm. and he didn't know who it was and the interrogator said to him, do you know where, where your wife is? Do you know what's going on with your wife? And they were making him think that this, these, these, this woman's mm, cries sure, were his sure. wife. But no, they were, they were Afia Siddiqui's cries. And he mm -hmm. tirelessly campaigned on, on her case mm -hmm. and, and on the case of many other people who were mm -hmm. just vanished in, 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 mm -hmm. in Pakistan. And of course, the, the, the issue is that we still have those people who are... You know who who, are dis who have disappeared. Nobody knows about it. But this is this is the character of this man that we're talking about. Uh, the man who we know as Mozambik. That he never gives up. Mm. You know he doesn't give up. He's. You know it must be very very difficult for his family members because they're frightened for him. How could you not be? Moaz, one of the most dangerous things you can do in any line of work is is speak truth to power. And Moazim has 
gone to Pakistan and, and accounted the, the, the leaders of Pakistan on, on issues of drones, for example, and their complicity, complicity in allowing mm -hmm. uh, drones to, to, to kill Pakistani civilians mm -hmm. um, without any, any recourse. Um, he's spoken out against things like Guantanamo, speaking out against America, one of the most powerful governments in the world. But yet, it's very interesting to note that when the WikiLeaks uh, came out, yeah. there was actu uh, actually a, a diplomat from Luxembourg mm -hmm. that said that Muazzam is the, the best advocate for trying to get the, the prisoners returned, mm -hmm. and he's doing our job for us because we want to get some of these people out of Guantanamo and we can't. Sure, sure. Of course, we have, we have another guest who has um, decided to arrive, and we will integrate him greatly, of course. Uh, it's uh, no other than my co-host who is with me um, every week, but uh, today he decided that he was going to come slightly late, but uh, we forgive him. Asalaamu Alaikum Adnan. Welcome. The show cannot work without you. <laughs> I do apologize, but we had exciting time. You know, Adnan, um, we are we're talking about this man called Mozambique. Um, his character, the great work that he's done. We've talked about. We've, you know, we had uh, Azam Beg who called his brother. We had Sa uh, brother Saad from um, uh, uh, from Pakistan who called us. Um, and talked about the time that he spent in Begram with Muslim. Um, so there's been quite a few calls. I think I wanted to ask you, if I can just ask you about this concept of justice. And from a legal perspective, you have injustice and justice. Is it really a crime to fight injustice? <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim um, I think you may have put a, a slightly unfair caveat upon the question right at the end. I do. Uh, in that you, you want me to discuss it or look at it in, in the context or paradigm of a legal system, as it were. All legal systems uh, and norms and paradigms that exist are instituted or put into place um, by those who ultimately end up holding power within those societies. And whilst you know, there is great benefit, obviously, uh, in a lot of the the law, um, if, if one were to be a cynic, you could say that even that benefit is because you know, some sort of order needs to reign within society for certain interests to be preserved and certain societal you know, uh, constructs to be put into place so that you have this different classes, etc. Et um, so I, I don't think it's fair to discuss it in the sense of in, in British law, is it fair or legal to you know, fight or speak against and uh, what is clear cut injustice or power. Um, the, the standard by which we judge um, is, is clear cut on this. You know, the, the, mm -hmm. the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this is there's, there's, there's no two ways about this. The greatest of shuhada amongst you, the words of the uh, Prophet, sallam, sallam, the greatest of shuhada amongst you is Hamza radiallahu anhu, and he who stood up in front of a tyrant ruler and said the haq. And he was killed for it. Right? So, so the the greatest, you know, um, amongst all of the people, uh, one of the desires that Muslims should harbour. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ said, "He who does not want to die the death of a shaheed is a munafiq." So, one of the uh, the desires that Muslims should have is to uh, die in the way where you are basically passed into heaven without accounting. And the highest amongst those is one who would stand in front of a tyrant ruler and accounting. So there's no debate about this issue. Um, but you can continue to discuss this you know, at length. And, and but is this where Muslim is coming from? You see, here we're talking about this man who, you know, earlier we talked about that he would cry at night because he felt that he had left his brothers in Guantanamo Bay. He was not able to do much for them, that he was released, that he got his freedom. Is that what Muslim is coming from? Is that where he's coming from? Individual sincerity and intent, uh, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can judge and only he can reward. Uh, we discuss what is apparent. Um, somebody like Mu Muazzam, um, I, I don't know this person in a, a great degree of depth, you know, on, on a personal level. But what does 
you know, uh, strike me as inspiring is somebody who's been through that process, who's, you know, been out there, and you have this zeal, you know, that, that I'm going to do this for the Ummah, I'm going to do this great work, humanitarian work, etc., etc. And then when you're, you know, taken under false pretenses to Guantanamo, that, to be fair, if you came out of there and you were retired, you've done your bit. But to continue to have that zeal, continue to have that drive, mm. that has to come from a very sincere place. This is what you were saying, isn't it? We exactly. were discussing early, uh, yeah. Kaleen, that he could have said, and we repeat that he could have said, okay, I'm going to sit at home and enjoy myself. Yeah. And, and not necessarily just the fact that I'm going to enjoy myself, but also that I have a very legitimate reasoning. I, I, am, I am a highly, you know, watched, already vilified, under the radar individual. Islam does not ask me to commit suicide. So I, going out there and putting myself on this line daily, going all the way out to Syria, we're not just talking going around Britain doing lectures, mm -hmm. going out to Syria, Pakistan, these places, putting myself you know, on the radar, making these people you know, uh, prick up their hair and mm -hmm. try and watch out and listen out for what I'm doing and what, what I'm saying. That, that can't be a very you know, astute move. It can't be a very uh, wise move. It makes sense if, if I take a backseat, you know, if somebody wants to have a discussion, with maybe a TV interview or somebody wants to have a discussion about a newspaper article, etc. Here and there, maybe I will continue to exist, but generally, there's no volition, there's no obligation upon me to continue to play this public life sort of role at the forefront of these things, which is kind of where you can make uh, uh, an assessment of the, uh, the drive, the, the inspiration, the sincerity of an individual. And I've, I've you know, heard the, uh, the, uh, a vast variety of different, you know, events, um, giving uh, speeches on a plethora of different topics. And it's, it's always been a case of, you know, you've, you've never got anything that you could term, well, pretty much anything from Islam you can term radical, but you know, as a Muslim, that you could say that was, that was radical, that was divisive, mm. that was sectarian, or walked away from a speech and thought, that was boring, because that does happen sometimes. Mm. It's always been inspiring, it's always been engaging, it's always mm. been very real, it's always been something you can connect with. And it's always been unifying, it's always been a, 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 on a variety of different platform, platforms from organizations who he's not a member of, he doesn't necessarily agree with, but the, the message of Islam has always been unifying, and I think those people are far and few in be, uh, for, for the Muslims as it is. Uh, it's a shame that, you know, he, he's in the predicament that he's in. You know, I, I'm sorry, I, I just, mm. Adnan just reminded me of something, that the last conference that I certainly attended where Muslim was speaking, I was quite surprised, it was in Manchester, it was organized by a, a, an organization, and I was quite surprised to find people from different faction uh, mm. of the Muslim world and I suddenly realized, my goodness, this is the first time that I have seen people from such diverse background come together. Yeah. And the leadership was, of course, as at none. Uh, but let's take this call. Um, good evening, David. Good evening, Andrew. David, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. And you? I'm not too bad, David. We've just been having an interesting discussion on Mozambique about kind of a person he is. And I know that uh, you have... Um, be, uh, witnessed uh, Muazzam speaking, and I just wondered if you can tell us what you felt, what kind of a person is Muazzam? Well, my initial reaction to him was that in spite of all that he's been through, there was absolutely no trace of bitterness or resentment mm. within him. Um, he remains totally dedicated to supporting hu the human rights of others, particularly those imprisoned unfairly. David, and I feel that his life is a very eloquent essay on how to approach persecution. I know you yourself are also a human rights activist. Do you believe that, um, that Muslim's ability to engage with people from diverse backgrounds is something that is, that is, we don't all, we don't all have that, do we? No, he, he's a very unique human being. And he, ha he has a great ability to, uh, to, as you say, blend in with other people and to be able to talk on their behalf and get alongside them and to understand their issues. 
David, thank you. Thank you so much. And I know you're ringing us from such a far away place. We're very grateful for your time. Thank you so much, David. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Bless you. Uh, th th this is um, David Gold, who is um, mm. a human, uh, human rights activist. Yeah. And um, he's a fantastic person who's gone out of his way. He's not a Muslim. Mm. He's very much a Christian, Christian priest. And he said, well, th this is a appalling. You know, the guy is a sincere guy. Yeah. And again, that thread that you talked about earlier. The, one of the things that David mentioned was the fact that Muslims not wasn't bitter about what, what had happened to him, that he, he didn't speak in angry terms, and he, he, he wasn't what you would call a, a, a rabble-rouser. Um, he was, as, as both said, uh, someone who, who brought unity. And I think never, more, never was it more clear that he was someone who spoke for unity and, and somebody who, um, who was very much a, a, a figure that brought people together, that when he went on the, the tour with Cage, um, which was uh, two sides of the story, um, where they, he went on a tour with guards from Guantanamo Bay. The people who had been involved in his um, in imprisonment, the people who had been involved in his, um, to some degree, torture, um, and he went on a tour with them. He, shared, he, he basically traveled up and down the country with them in cars and, and buses and lived with them pretty much for, for, the, for the duration of that tour. And he was kind to them, and he was sweet to them, and he treated them with good manners, as the Prophet ﷺ would. Yeah? Because he didn't hold a grudge, he didn't uh, hold it against them what they'd done to him and, and their part and the, the part they played in his capture and in, in his imprisonment. Uh, they, w they had realized that their mistakes, and, and he forgave them and moved on and worked with them because that was what was better for the, for the, for the cause. And that, that's Muazim through and through. He does what's right for the cause without bitterness and without, without anger and separation. You know, it was amazing actually to see him sit next to the guard, the Marine, the US Marine that mm -hmm. actually guarded him. Yeah. Um, it, it was quite a, quite a sight to see both of them sat there actually laughing. Yeah. And that is very powerful because it really dismantles you. You know, in many faiths, um, and especially in Islam, we're taught about forgiveness. Um, and we're taught to, to embrace forgiveness into ourselves. There's a, a very powerful hadith, it's quite long, I won't go through it all, um, where the Prophet ﷺ, uh, said that uh, the man who's about to walk in, um, to, he, he's forgiven, he's one of the people of Jannah. So one of the Sahaba went and stayed with him. He stayed with him for, for a period. And I, I'm abbreviating the Hadith here. And at the end, he couldn't work out what it was about this guy that, that was going to make him a person of Jannah. He, he didn't pray more. He didn't fast more. He, he, I mean, there was, he couldn't work it out. And he said to him, look, why is it? The Prophet ﷺ said that you are one of the people of Jannah. What is it about you that will make you one of these people of Jannah? He said, Allah knows best. But Every night before I go to bed, I forgive everybody who did me any wrong during the day. SubhanAllah. And maybe that forgiveness that we have for other people will be the forgiveness that Allah SWT will show to us. And Muazzam was somebody who embodied that. If it's one thing to forgive your, your, your sister for stealing your chocolates or forgive um, someone for cutting you up in the traffic. It's another thing to forgive somebody who took away your freedom who imprisoned you and held you, who was a party to beating you and torturing you. To forgive that person takes character. Would I be, would I be, would I be ra right in saying that people like Nelson Mandela spent 26 years incarcerated and they forgave, you know, when you took, to look at uh, Truth and Reconciliation. Are we talking about the same kind of no. Forgiveness? No, we're not. And Explain. And this is the part where I... We differ? Yourselves and millions of others will disagree, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that somebody like Mandela comes even close to people like Mozambique. Um, Mandela's principles, whatever they may be derived from, are not really of my concern. Um, but those people who derive their uh, principles, both of forgiveness and uh, avenging something, both of being kind and being harsh, showing mercy and showing strength, 
who get all of those things from the established objective standard of Allah SWT are far superior human beings than Mandela might have been a kind-hearted, empathetic person. Okay, struggle you can start relating. But I, I, I've said this to you every time we spoke about Muslim. And I say it again, simply because the first time I ever actually heard the brother speak was at a Quran Ijtima, uh, many, four or five years ago, uh, in Birmingham. And his topic on which he was doing his speech was, how does the Quran help those who are you know, suffering across the Muslim world? Uh, how does it give them solace and strength? And he quoted something which he said, when we were imprisoned and we used to pray the Quran, we used to come back to this ayah time and time again, where the Quran speaks about Yusuf alayhi yes. and it says, and we left him in prison for only seven years. That is the value or worth of seven years to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's nothing. So we thought, you know, what are, what are we so, you know, depressed or downtrodden about? So what if our liberties gone? He was a prophet of Allah. Allah kept him incarcerated because he, he tests those who he loves. So the, the place from which you derive your strength, or he derives, derived that, that mindset, both which allowed him to become a, uh, an example amongst those who he was with in Guantanamo, and that forgiving person when he was on the outside comes from Islam, and that doesn't even come close, so I, I find it slightly weird that we would even make that comparison. That's Except why for that he's my co-host. That they were both incarcerated. <laughs> Mashallah, yeah. That's why he's my co-host. He keeps me, um, yeah. you know, he keeps me on the ground. He does. It's but it's a very important point, it's my very, isn't it? Very, he? very important point. And Muazzam, I remember I went to see Muazzam uh, give a speech um, before I, I would later end up spending a, a, a period of time in prison, later found innocent. And in that speech, Muazzam said that I had never read Surah Al Yusuf until I'd been in prison. Now he'd read, the, he, he'd memorized it before he'd been to prison. Mm. But um, Alhamdulillah, Hafiz. But um, he said I'd never read it until I read that Surah in prison. And I remembered that when I was in prison. And one of the first things I did when when I was there, I picked up the Quran and, I, and remembering his words and his advice, I turned to turned to that. And subhanAllah, there was, there was solace. And as I, as I was reading to myself, I could actually hear the, the words of Muazzam as well um, uh, as, a, as a support. And these are things that Muazzam will never know. Muazzam will never realize that people that heard his talks, that, that then go through trials of their own, took strength and solace from his words. He won't know that, but that would be written down for him. And, sorry. No, I'm sorry. It's okay. I know you're very and close to him. Yeah. I know. I know. Subhanallah. He, 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 he said, I remember, uh, he would start many of his talks. People don't realize this about Muslim. He, he had a bookshop as well. He was a very literary man. He uh, read books, not just Islamic books, but um, the, the classics. And he was, he was a very, very educated man. And I remember he started one of his uh, talks. Um, uh, saying it was the best of times and the worst of times, and I was shocked. I was like, Guantanamo, how can Guantanamo be the best of times? This is one of the darkest prisons, one of the most horrible places. And subhanAllah, he spoke about the, the iman that you can get from being in prison and making that salah in, in, in that cell, and knowing that you're in the company of people, of, 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 of prophets. You're in the company of, of the, 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 the great imams, the, 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 the four imams all spent periods of time in prison. Um, and so whichever madhab you follow, your, 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 your imam was, was spent time in prison. SubhanAllah. These are the people that he was in the company of while he, while he was making that tahajjid. He may have been making a tahajjid in solitary confinement where he didn't see anybody for two years in that cell, but he had them in his jamaat. He had them as his company because he kept the Quran and he kept Islam close to his heart. I, I think what, what obviously the focus of the program is to speak about somebody who, who is a you know is, is well both recognized and well liked across uh, the, the general Muslim populace. Mm. I've, I've and non-Muslims of course too. I, I've mm. never non-Muslims is a little bit less controversial for me simply because they don't hold the sectarian differences that we do. Yeah. But very rarely do you have Muslims unite upon one individual, very rarely. Mm -hmm. And he does, that's yes. such an there's important about, there's point. There's about three or four like, issues, like, yes. three or four of them I've actually overestimated this, but Palestine, you know, you, yes. you could probably count them on a hand, I've run out of them by saying Palestine, literally. Mm -hmm. There are issues on which you can say, yeah, we, we pretty much agree. 
Otherwise, we, we, it's very rare. And I've never come across you know, a, any strand of Muslim who's ever had anything bad to say. But the, the more important aspect, though, is I think you should probably widen this, the discussion slightly in that let, let's forget the fact that you're speaking about the, the personality of Muslim Baig mm -hmm. and look at the context in which you're speaking. I, a, a Muslim who not only dares to stand up to power but say the, uh, the, uh, the haq in, in a society that is battle not just here but across the globe, um, is eventually incarcerated and punished for it. it. It seems like pretty much the story you would expect, and that is the real shame. Mm. That is the real disaster for us. And that is what would highlight the importance of the struggles of people like Muslim. Uh, th th these were the kind of things, these were the kind of issues which were more important because Muslim has some degree of repute and some degree of, uh, you know, for the want of a better word, celebrity, uh, in that Muslims will know, people will know of who he is. But there are millions of Muslims, mm. people across the Muslim world, who are being punished, tortured, incarcerated without trial for the exact same reasons. But we for don't know for of wanting to speak out, sure. for doing nothing of, you know, of the nature of terrorism or you know, hurting innocents or anything of that nature, but for fighting authority, okay. for standing up to authority. And that is back. the real tragedy. Now we're going to come back to that such an important point. We're going to take a short break. Please don't go away. It is an important topic. We do have another 10, 15 minutes after this break. Join me back within the next few seconds. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Community Platform. The subject matter is very much Mozambique, his humanitarian work. What's this? What is he like? We heard from Azam Beg, his brother, from David Gold, someone who has heard Muslim speak. We heard from Brother Saad from Pakistan, who spent some time at Begram with him, and of course, two of my guests. When we started the show, I read you out a part of the message that I received from his wife, and we talked about how he would sob at night because he felt that he hadn't, he'd left his friends at Begram. I just want to go back and read you the last couple of lines. She says that to he, wanted to, he, he wants to stand up for the Ummah, to speak the truth, and to seek justice for all. And this keeps coming back, Kalim. It's, it's always for others. What Adnan said, getting closer to his goal. Win-win yeah. situation. This is the thing. Muazzam, alhamdulillah, and inshallah, may Allah keep all of us sincere in what we're doing. But everything that we've seen from him, and even, even staying at his house, it was an experience where you, you didn't want to say too much because even just to, to, to listen to, to him talking and it was, it was a dars. And he, he wouldn't preach, he wasn't a preachy man. Um, he, he never took a title of Ustad or Imam or Sheikh. Um, and in fact, if you ever called him Sheikh, he would say, no, 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 Akhi, Akhi, I'm your Akhi, not your Sheikh. Mm -hmm. yeah? And, but in just listening to him and, and using your, uh, your facilities in, in, in the ratio they were given to you, one mouth and two ears, you would, you would take things in. And subhanAllah, this was, this was him. He was constantly giving. And a lot of the time it was so, so second nature to him that he didn't even realize what he was giving you as he was, as, as he was doing it. Win-win then. Um, again, I'll, I'll use the you know, exaggerate for effect, as it were. But uh, there isn't a Muslim who's, you know, conversing with the Quran at all, who hasn't heard of the ayah of those who are killed in the path of Allah. Do not say they are dead. Mm -hmm. To you they might be, because, you know, you're limited, like you said, you know, eyes, ears, that's all you are. To you they might be dead, but don't say they're dead. You see, after a lot of these things, a lot of these goals, and a lot of these uh, objectives are transcendent in the very first place. So that attainment also doesn't necessarily manifest itself in a tangible way where you, where you can see what is happening. Um, but ultimately, you know, we're, we're believers in this deen, which is you know, not just the deen of haq, but also the deen of justice. For every you know, um, mustard seed of act, you will be rewarded. And for every good intent, you will be rewarded. So that there's, there's no way um, that, you know, in the house of Allah, he's not getting that, that justice for, for which we, you know, you, you can quite easily and eloquently for hours, you know, discuss uh, the, the brother's individual achievements. But the overall sense of 
Watu izu mantasha, watu zillu mantasha. Whoever we will, yeah, we give Ezra to, and whoever we will, we, we you know, give the complete opposite. We already spoke about the unifying factor of an individual. That in itself, it, it might not be def definitive because we're not the, uh, the people who decide Jannah or Jahannam, heaven and hell. But it's, it's very strong evidence, as it were, that in, in carrying out the duties of Allah's deen for others, if you are given is across the board by Muslims, people who believe that same faith as you, even though they might hate each other over issues, you're probably doing something right. Yeah. How, how, how often is it, how, how much of a rarity is it that one person can be liked by so many different groups? The, uh, one of the things that upset me when I first became Muslim was, was the, the separation, do you know what I mean? Oh, we listen to this scholar, or would they listen to that scholar? Muslim mm -hmm. transcends that. If the if um, obviously khali, uh, khilafa is on uh, in, in the topic and unity and you know people everyone's talking about sort of ummah and these things, he was someone that people from all backgrounds could relate yes. to and 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 accept, and that is a sign that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala isn't going to put love in the hearts of so many people for for a man who isn't doing good deeds, mm -hmm. and it was the fact that he spoke constantly for justice and that he. He spoke to, to very basic principles, uh, and, and that's the, 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 uh, the wideness of his, of his message. Um, he said to me one time that um, uh, people say that innocent until proven guilty all the time. Um, Let me just take this call. I'm sorry, sorry. I'm cutting you there, but let's take this call. Mrs. Tahir Bhatt, Salaam Alaikum. Hello, Salaam Alaikum. Salaam Alaikum. Bradford, I beg your pardon. Hello? Hello, I can hear you. Uh, I want to make a few comments, please. Uh, just, uh, you know, uh, in uh, normal days, like when something happened in the uh, Muslim world or uh, something happened, uh, any terrible incident or something horrific or something bombardment in, 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 in Muslim countries, we get together and uh, uh, we want to do something. But in normal days, why don't we establish and get together and uh, those intellectual and uh, all those pe people, professional people, get together and establish something to protect our rights and uh, before uh, we surrender our, our freedom completely to those people who want to snatch our freedom and snatch our territories and f f snatch everything from us. Thank you so much, sister. You, you. Unity is, is, a, is a loud and clear cry uh, across the, the Ummah now. And it's, it's very heartening because when you're in the middle of that discussion and that struggle for you know, five or ten years, what you, what you don't realize is these necessary gradual changes don't necessarily impact themselves on you because you wake up next day and you don't realize what's changed since yesterday because it's a very slow movement. Mm -hmm. But if you come to something having been away from it, uh, the, the, the change is huge and it's massive and mm. unity may not necessarily represent the exact same thing to every single individual sure. but it, the, it is calling out you know, for that, that is becoming the norm. But, but what I would say on, on the topic of Muslim is that the, the drive which you will face <coughs> when trying to um, you know, advocate or propagate the message of justice, the message of Islam or unity, um, it, it will invariably, you know, you, you will face these sanctions and you will face this kind of um, horrific sort of treatment. Um, and I say this simply because I, I'm sure everybody's come across it by now because it's, you know, common news. But Abu Qatada was, yes. was acquitted of all charges yesterday. Now, whether he was or was not, guilty of what he, you know, he allegedly did um, is th there's, a, there's a court that is greater than all courts and that court you don't need any evidence or cross-examination he already knows right? and there that he, he'll make the just decision but as far as this world is concerned that man is as innocent as you can get because he had separate trials over separate terrorism charges and he was acquitted of all of them by a government who wasn't trusted enough to carry out the trial because they would uh, torture him in the first place. But what it does highlight, it does highlight one thing to you, which is if the Jordanian courts 
and it's actually more shocking to me because I deal with this on a daily basis. If the Jordanian courts can see that there is insufficient evidence for this, why did this government spend millions of pounds of taxpayers' money, appeal after appeal after appeal, despite the European Court of Human Rights deciding in his favour, still appealing those decisions, starting it right from the beginning from you know, uh, primary courts, 13 years trying to acquit this person who was innocent in the end, they vilified him, kept him under house reps, kept him in jail, the media had an absolute field day for well over a decade. Why? Because you can do that to a Muslim in this country, and no, or not, sorry, th that's slightly unfair. Not in this country, in this society. America is probably even worse than us. In, in, in those societies that are driven by this idea of these people, they say something that is different, therefore automatically they are wrong. I don't necessarily agree with the views of, you know, for, for somebody like Abu Qatada. But the point is, what, what sort of a degenerative mental sort of state do you have to be in to make somebody's life such a misery for which they are proven not guilty after 14 years and he has no recompense for it? As in, he's still the one who is described yesterday in the headline as a radical cleric, Abu Qatada, cleared of all charges. And I disagree. He's still the radical guy. Sorry. Oh, we must take this call. Uh, good, good evening, Carol. Good evening, nice to talk to you. Salam alaikum, Carol. So good to hear your voice. And of course, uh, you know Kaleem really well. Um, Carol, of course, we've been discussing about Marzam, about his character as a friend. You've known him for such, such a long time. Tell us something about him that you think, you know, this is Marzam. Well, I was always so impressed at how hard he worked to help to resettle the detainees from Guantanamo. And there was one particular person, and I remember he went to Slovakia and interviewed this person. And he was, he was determined always to find a, a place for people because it was very difficult when people left Guantanamo. Um, you know, there weren't many countries that wanted to help people. And he would go all over trying to persuade other countries to, um, you know, to accept former detainees. And I can remember one particular time, um, he was so concerned because one of the brothers had a disability and he was, you know, he was really wanting this person to um, have the opportunity to, you know, be in married life again. So he, he put a note, you know, saying to the, you know, sisters, please consider this man, he's a very good man and, um, you know, d don't um, judge on a disability. So he was always thinking about people. Mm. And... Also, he had a very good sense of humor, and you could see the irony in situations. And I remember one particular article that we, we both really laughed at, and it was about a place in England called Scarborough, and a local fish and chip shop person had been sent a letter suggesting that it might become the next sort of terrorist target. This is a fish and chip shop in Scarborough. So, we, you know, we thought that was really funny because that was how ridiculous the situation was getting that, um, you know, I mean, this, this fish and chip man was just so astounded that he should receive this letter, you know, saying that, that his property might be a concern. And it just showed how, th you know, how things were getting very, very um, ridiculous, you know, people's concerns. And also that money was being spent, you know, this um, in these areas when, when money could have been better spent by local police elsewhere. So we had a bit of a laugh about that, really, the irony of it. Carol, I hope that uh, very soon we will all join him together and maybe he can tell us a joke or two and we can laugh until then. Thank you so much for your time. I know you're an extremely busy lady. Jazakallah khair, Carol. Thank you. Take Salam. care. Bye. Assalamu alaikum. Carol Ann Grayson, of course, a writer, a journalist in, in her own right, who has uh, done a tremendous amount of work with Mozambique. We're coming to that red, um, that part of, the, part of the program where today I wish we could go on, but, you know, sadly, time stands for no one. I'm very grateful to you, Kaleem, for coming all that way. Uh, and you were fasting, and which I hadn't realized at that time. Oh, I am very that. grateful, very grateful to you. And Adnan, of course, my um, uh, co-host, um, we'll have to punish you for being late, but we'll do that later, uh, no doubt. I just want to finish off by reading the last sentence written by his wife uh, in the email, if, if I may share that with you. Uh, I, 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 it's extremely important. She said that, so I do hope that his words did move you 
and that today you will stand for him as he stood for all of us. And remember the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O you who believe, stand firmly for justice as witnesses to Allah. That's Muslim's wife. Muslim Beg is a brother, a friend to many. He has st he stood up, he's still standing up for justice for all. Humanitarian worker, as Caroline Grayson said, he also has a sense of humor. But I also remember words that were said to me by my co-host. You know, none of you may not remember some of the words, but I remember them clearly. That sometimes, when you're sitting on the fence or on a wall, people will walk past you or agree with you. The day that you take that jump off and join one side is the day when things can get difficult. We have taken sides. We stand for justice. We stand with our brother. Please stand with him. Jazakallah khair for watching and allowing me and my guests to come into your homes without asking. Until then, when we meet again and look after your neighbor, whoever they may be. Assalamu alaikum, Allah Hafiz.